Um, we released a, uh, a media release, we released two actually, which were fairly fulsome in the details. Uh, as you know, yesterday at about 2.30 p.m., uh, a gentleman we allege, Ida Garung, age 34, uh, here in Burlington, attacked his wife, Yogaswari Kadka, age 32, with a cleaver uh, inside of 72 Hyde Street. The attack then spilled outside. Numerous uh, neighbors saw it. Um, Mr. Garung is also alleged to have attacked Tulsa Ramal, age 54, his mother-in-law with, uh, uh, excuse me, with uh, the cleaver as well. Uh, Ms. Gatka went on to die of her injuries. We were able to apprehend uh, Mr. Garung using uh, actually some, some excellent tactics that our officers have been practicing to, to take armed people into custody safely. And uh, it looks like Ms. Ramal will survive her injuries. She's uh, in stable condition at the hospital right now. And I did also mention, and this is just recapping what was widely released in our, our, um, our media release, that a, a gentleman, he's uh, Mr. John Casey, uh, produced a, is a black powder firearm? Yes, sir. Produced a black powder firearm, which he used to momentarily hold the suspect at bay just a few seconds before the, the police arrived. Uh, those are the facts. Again, they're not new facts. That's just a recap of the facts. I know there's probably a lot of follow-up questions. In some regards, that fact pattern is, is fairly simple and straightforward and concise. Uh, but I know there's a lot of concerns about other attendant facts and, and follow-up questions, so I'll take them now. Can you speak to the October 7th interaction police had with the suspect? Sure. On October 7th, Officer Mike Henry was dispatched to a call in a uh, WCAX. You're going to invest in a new stand here. Uh, Officer Mike Henry was uh, dispatched to a call in a, a north, excuse me, Old North End deli. Uh, the suspect is believed to have walked into that deli asked for the police. Uh, the police were called on his behalf. Uh, in sum and substance, he made some statements about how he was involved in an act of domestic violence the night before with his wife, uh, that he was having some mental health issues, that he, uh, he needed help. Police officers conducted a thorough investigation that day. Uh, they went back to his residence. They tried to collect evidence of a, of a domestic incident and were unable to find evidence of violence. Uh, they then went and found uh, the victim, the present-day victim, Ms. Uh, Kadka, at her place of, of work, uh, 1700 Shelburne Road, the Comfort Inn and Suites. They interviewed her there. She said, yes, my husband is having some mental health, health issues. He does take medicine. I think he's slipping off his meds. This is a problem, uh, but I don't think he committed a crime against me the night before. So uh, lacking probable cause to arrest based on a crime, they counseled uh, uh, Mr. Garung about the availability of his services. He was transported to a uh, crisis at the UVM Medical Center, and that was the last contact we had with him uh, until yesterday. Uh, yes, yeah, so it appears to be our first contact. Can you uh, walk us through the timeline of what you think the suspect uh, day, how it started and how it progressed yesterday? Um, now, I have to stress that this is based on an interview with the father-in-law um, because we have not been able to, nor would we at this point request uh, UVM medical records. But uh, the father-in-law uh, states that Speaking with his, uh, his daughter that day, uh, the, the defendant asked to be checked out of the UVM Medical Center. He said, I'd, li I'd, I'd like to leave uh, UVM Medical Center. And again, I'm speaking, uh, recapping statements that the, the grandfather made, um, meaning the father-in-law. He said, if he's there voluntarily, they couldn't hold him. He wished to go home. So uh, his, his wife, the victim, uh, Ms. Kadka, came and picked him up sometime around noon maybe between noon and one, it's, uh, it's an approximation, uh, drove him back to the residence between one and two, and at 2.30, he's alleged to have murdered his wife. How did the mother-in-law come into that situation? Uh, the mother-in-law lives with the, uh, it's, so the, the, these four people and the child live together. The, uh, the mother-in-law, the father-in-law, the suspect, the suspect's wife and the child are all at 72 Hyde Street. Does that answer your question? I, I think, I mean, was she trying to intervene? In no, she's 54 years old, and, and uh, in fact, we believe inside the home she was uh, mobile, but outside the home she usually required a wheelchair to get around. I don't think she tried to intervene. I think she was just attacked, but that's uh, um, part of the ongoing investigation. Do you have any clarity with that? I don't have anything to add to that. Okay. Oh, by the way, I apologize. This is uh, Detective Lieutenant Mike Warren, uh, head of our Detective Bureau, and Deputy Chief uh, Sean Burke, the Chief of Operations and Patrol. Were officers, you mentioned that the officers used the, the ballistic shield. Right. Were they the target at all, or was that just sort of a, a you know, preventive kind of thing, or you know, had they, did he turn any violence towards the officer? Uh, no, no, the officers were not injured, and uh, there's no reason to believe that they were the intended target of an attack. What you'll see, 
you know, time and again in, in Burlington and in American policing, there's officers having to face violent people with edge weapons, a cleaver, a knife, a garden tool, uh, you know, all sorts of stuff, a machete. So, you know, one of the things that, that, that we take seriously is our leadership with the Police Executive Research Forum in tactics and training and equipment and team-based techniques to apprehend people with edge weapons safely. Part of that is the, the use of the proper shields. This is a, a pioneering concept in American policing. It doesn't always guarantee that everything's going to work out without the police needing to use force. It does give us some, some reaction time and some protection so that uh, we, can, we can at least try not to use force when we interdict in these circumstances. When, when your officers engaged the suspect, was he still holding the cleaver? There came a point where between the introduction of the officers and the gentleman with the firearm, and you know, we're looking at video, I, I can't say for certain, but within that window of a few seconds, he, he dropped the cleaver, put his hands up. Did he make statements? What was his demeanor like uh, when he was arrested? Um, he didn't make statements uh, that we can disclose at this time. And uh, in fact, I don't know if you want to answer that question, but I, I, don't, I don't recall him making any statements. No statements. No statements. Is there a language barrier? Uh, I, he didn't make any statements in any language. How important was that bystander's action who had the firearm? How much do you think did that mean? And kind of how long was that period? Uh, the, the bystander with the firearm um, actually came into, so, so what you got to understand, and I'm sure if you go and interview folks on the block, there are a lot of people watching. And, uh, you know, one of the things that they were doing is, is taking uh, cell cam uh, videos or smartphone videos. Uh, there were people who were brave in trying to get as close as they felt they could get to scream at him, tell him to stop. Uh, in this case, Mr. Casey was at a distance. A lot, most of the injuries, if not all, and I think the evidence will bear this out, were inflicted prior to, to any bystander physically intervening. Um, Mr. Casey intervenes in the very last seconds, maybe 30 seconds before the police uh, approach. So, um, I mean, it's hard to know. I'm not going to speculate on what would have made a difference, but uh, all of that was very far along in the attack. Was it clear based on the October 7th interaction whether there's a language barrier with this individual? No, it's not, it's not clear. I, I apologize. I don't, I don't have that for you. Um, yeah. You mentioned there's bystander video. Is there also a body cam footage? Yeah, of course. Right. There will be body camera footage. The father-in-law, though, provided statements via an interpreter. Is that correct? Uh, he spoke decent English, but I think we used an interpreter just to be sure that we could catch all the nuance of what he was saying. How much time? Nepal. Do you know how long they've been here? Uh, no. Does he have refugees? Yes. Well, the child, I, I believe, was born here, but yes. They're a refugee family. Um, the child, uh, I mean, one of the interesting things about, and, and I think it bears further discussion, is that DCF said that we first at least had to try to get permission from the alleged killer to allow the child to be placed with someone else in the family. Uh, we were able to get that documented permission, but I was, I was, I just I think it's a strange artifact of how the system works out. We were looking to place the child with the grandfather, provided that the grandfather was able to uh, care for the child and continue working. I know DCF is committed to making sure the child has, uh, um, proper shelter, proper care, and can be as close to family as possible. And that connection, connection with DCF has already been made? Yeah, that was made, yeah, last night from the moment we uh, were able to locate the child. So, Chief, in, in light of what you said about the previous um, assertion about domestic violence, mm -hmm. do you have any comment about the adequacy of mental health or the current law that allowed to walk out the door? Yeah, you know, we, we don't know what, what happened uh, at the hospital. It's, spe it's speculation to say it. Uh, I, I, the attack was, was a brutal attack. It, it is hard for me to see that, the, the sentiment behind that attack developing between noon and two. Um, but I don't know what was said or done or presented at the hospital. There is a question in psychiatric care in Vermont and generally about what threshold uh, is appropriate for holding on to people involuntarily. We've dealt with that threshold question in many other cases before. Um, I don't know how this case bears on it, but that's a discussion that, that we should have. Chief, was the suspect continuously hospitalized from Saturday to midday yesterday, and was it voluntary the whole time? Um, that, the only reason I would say yes to that question is based on the statements of the father-in-law. That's all I have to go on. So, um, and he was unequivocal about saying that, but bear in mind that's not coming from the hospital or the police or any official records. It's a statement to the father in law. You, you mentioned neighbors um, watching this or seeing this right. happen. Do you have a timeline how long this attack actually went on? Um, what would you say, Mike? I would say just a few short min minutes before uh, bystanders in the area called the police and made reports. Okay, so right away people called and then it, it went on for maybe two or three minutes? Yeah, just a few short minutes. Okay. Yep. How 
how did people know something was wrong? Was it only at the point where they had spilled out onto the street, or was there screams heard from inside? Yeah, uh, neighbors could hear screaming. Uh, at first, uh, one of the neighbors said that they thought it was children that were screaming, uh, and then she went outside and saw the attack taking place. Uh, and other people that were walking by heard it and um, were drawn to other people that were yelling at the suspect and, and trying to get him to stop at that point. You know, now how many uh, times both victims were hit? Numerous. Many, many times. I don't, have, uh, I don't have an exact count as of yet. Were you able to just describe the wounds? They were uh, extremely severe. Head wounds, lacerations, deep. Um, mostly uh, severed um, in some um, extremities, um, severe damage to um, skull. skull, skull fractures, um, very, very severe head wounds. When you say a cleaver, what, what size blade are we talking about? Uh, the blade is uh, maybe 10, 10 inches okay. with an additional handle that extends off from that. Does it in your opinion, Chief, does it speak at all no. to the uh, suspect's mental state that he responded to having a firearm pointed at him, then responded to police and dropped the weapon? I mean, I think that that's something, you know, without speculating, that he was responsive to the threat of lethal force, right? When he had guns pointed at him, he uh, threw the cleaver down and put his hands up, you know. Uh, uh, since this will become a subject of prosecution, I'll let uh, the prosecution and psychiatric experts uh, determine what that may mean, but I can just report as a matter of observed fact that when guns were pointed at him, he, uh, he surrendered. The charges, according to the state's attorney, are first-degree murder and first-degree attempted murder. Why is there reason to believe that this was premeditated as opposed to a crime of passion, so to speak? I'll leave that to the, to the prosecution to answer. What light can you shed on the background of the suspect other than just what you've seen so far? What else have you learned about I think, uh, you know, we, we try to be forthcoming with the public about a person's criminal history and prior contacts we've had, and in this case, uh, few to none. I mean, really just October 7th. Um, it took us, in fact, a while to affirmatively identify everybody. Uh, these are folks that kept to themselves, that were quiet, the, their age, spelling of their name, uh, associates were um, not readily known. Part of that is, is the Nepalese community is, is uh, not as integrated as, we, as we'd like. Uh, into the rest of the community. I mean, it's just it's a cultural issue that the whole community is trying to overcome. Um, and, and part of it is just that they kept out of trouble. And so, uh, which is, you know, a great thing until this point. Um, so we don't know much. In your press release yesterday, you said uh, someone said something about a deteriorating relationship. What, what did that exactly mean? That they were having some problems, that they were okay before, uh, but as of that night, like uh, October 6th, that They'd engage in a dispute, possibly a fight, that the marriage wasn't going well, they're having some marriage problems. So there was, was there just fights or was there any violence? We have very little to go on. No, I mean, the, 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 the suspect called the police and said he, he was trying to confess domestic violence, but there's no evidence of it at the home and there was no uh, um, corroboration. And when we contacted the deceased, the, the wife, um, she said, yeah, I understand he's, you know, quote unquote, I'm just using a phrase, he's off his meds. Uh, he has mental, mental issues, uh, but he did not uh, commit violence against me last night. And that's all we had to go on. We do have a domestic violence officer. We are one of the only um, police agencies in the state and in the region, in fact, the water region, that has a dedicated domestic violence officer that does nothing but look into, uh, develop cases against, do outreach for domestic violence issues. So, I mean, we're proud to say we don't take things, these things lightly. We do very thorough investigations. Uh, and in this case, we didn't come up with, with much on